I'm chatting to Sam Shabalala, who is the CEO of Standard Bank. You're watching Captains of Industry on CNBC Africa. Sam, so thanks very much for your time. Great pleasure, Pranon. Thank you for having me. Let's start in a completely different manner. Tell me what your day to day was like from okay. a diary perspective. <laughs> I want to get some insight into what it takes to run one of the big four banks in South Africa, in Africa. Indeed. So I got up uh, as I normally get up, stumbled to the, the shower, <laughs> stumbled to the kitchen, having had my shower, had breakfast. My first meeting was at the bank in, uh, in Rosebank, at our uh, Rosebank offices where we are th uh, this afternoon. Uh, we had an hours meeting, uh, sort of starting to think about um, what we're going to be saying to the investment community next week and refining our thoughts. Uh, after that, I rushed across to Bramfontein to go and attend uh, the Liberty board meeting. Um, which nearly got me to be late for our meeting. Uh, finished that, rushed across here, and here I am. But a typical day, there isn't a typical day, they vary. Um, but you rushed off your feet pretty much most, most of, of the, the time. time. People want a piece of you on a regular basis. They do indeed. Yeah. How do you balance that? It's, it's hard, I suppose, you have to prioritize. Uh, and the first priority is clearly uh, the work uh, here at Standard Bank. And it also depends on the time of the year. So during this week and next week, it's board meetings, so the board takes priority. Other weeks, it'll be clients, and I'll be visiting clients. Other weeks, it will be staff, where I'll be spending time with staff. And other weeks, it will be stakeholders uh, who I have to deal with, regulators, political parties, reg um, policy makers, uh, and so forth. So you were appointed in March 2013, so almost two and a half years now at the helm of Standard Bank, obviously a position that you hold jointly with Ben Kruger. The, the onus on you, having taken over from Jaco Marie, one of the doyens of the banking environment, did that weigh on you in the initial stages of the appointment? It did, and it continues to weigh. And I think the weight, though, uh, is the responsibility uh, towards 50, 50,000 uh, staff members, uh, 12 million clients, um, the responsibilities to the South African economy and indeed the 20 other countries where we are represented, where we're at the center of the economy. Um, their responsibility is immense uh, and especially given the role that financial institutions play in an economy. Before we move off the, the joint CEO discussion, how has that uh, position been sharing it with Ben? It's been fantastic. Uh, let's start at a personal level. Uh, ben and I have worked together. In fact, I don't know if you're aware of this, he recruited me. Uh, him together with I'm not David sure many Monroe. people know that yeah. fact at all. So it's one, one of the interesting little facts. So I was recruited by David Munro, who's a, one of our team members, uh, and Ben. Um, so I've worked with him for 15 years. I've worked very closely with him over the last uh, seven years. Uh, initially as one of the, uh, there were three deputy CEOs, if you recall, together with Peter Wharton Hood, and then now latterly as a, uh, one of the CEOs. It's a real privilege. It's fantastic working with Ben. Um, it's been a long-term partnership then. It's been a long-term partnership. We don't believe in hero leadership at Standard Bank. Yeah, of course, mostly you will have single, single leaders, but from time to time you share responsibility and we're quite happy to, to share responsibility. Do you think that this is a better model than your traditional single CEO? I don't think it's better. I think it's appropriate for where we are. And that was the reasoning of the board and I agree entirely with the board's reasoning. Restructuring over the last two and a half year period, you've pulled out of some of the emerging market territories beyond Africa. Do you feel now that the focus is right for Standard Bank, obviously with a dominant position in Africa? Oh, absolutely. We did what was rational in the mid 2000s. We were following our clients, we were following uh, developments in global trade and investment, and we were positioning ourselves to be a successful emerging markets bank. The world changed to 2007, 2008. We had built- Took everybody by surprise. Uh, indeed. Uh, we had built an infrastructure that was appropriate for a mid-sized uh, bank based in, in London for our international operations. It was no longer appropriate following the financial uh, markets uh, crisis. Um, we took a decision that based on 
the competitive dynamics in the world based on our resources and based on what we were good at and what we knew we could do best, it was better for us to focus on Africa. And as you correctly point out, we disposed of all the assets that were not necessary uh, to execute an Africa-focused strategy. And that was really completed when we uh, did the transaction with the ICBC in respect of uh, our, PL our London PLC business. Having right-sized for Africa focus is the biggest opportunity in Africa beyond South Africa's borders. I think it's tempting to single out one product set to one set of clients or one geography. And I think you're trying to push me towards the geography. And I'll come back to the ge to geographies. But the opportunity is actually a portfolio effect. Uh, the fascinating thing about the African continent is that the different countries and the different regions are no longer correlated to one another. So from a, a portfolio risk management perspective, it makes sense to hold a portfolio similar to the one we hold. So that's one observation. The second observation is that the economies on the continent have diversified and they're less prone to the movements in commodity prices than they previously were. And the next observation, of course, is that as Africa starts to operate as a region, so if you had the free trade area, for example, the following the signature in, in Egypt uh, by, by African leaders, you can envisage uh, hundreds of uh, millions of, of, of African people, the free movement of goods, people, and services across the continent, large consumer bases, and lots of interconnecting infrastructure. All of that is an incredible opportunity for and a bank And in many such instances, as Standard Bank has had first move advantage yes. on the continent. Indeed, we have, uh, we have the privilege of having been associated with Standard Chartered um, up until 1988, when they used, they used to own Standard Bank and they sold it in 1988. And since 1988, we've had a strategy of expansion, geographic expansion. Um, and uh, the management today is continuing to execute upon a strategy that was built by great leaders in the 1980s. I'm not trying to push you to, to a region, but I am assuming that you will move where the consumer is. And you look then at the Nigerian opportunity with 165 million plus in terms of population, but you also mentioned the regional integration. If you look at East Africa yep. uh, and you cobble together all of those individual countries, you've also got a huge population at your disposal. disposal. Would that be the, the trend that you, you follow population size? All of the above, uh, all of the above. So the beauty of the continent is obviously the dem great demographics. The population is getting younger. It's getting healthier. Uh, infant mortality is uh, declining. Uh, life expectancy is extending. People are getting wealthier. They're having greater disposable income. So any business that faces consumers is always going to do really, really well. Likewise, you've got infrastructure that needs to be built, roads, bridges, uh, ports. Um, Mining uh, necessitates the building of a lot of this infrastructure and so forth. Therefore, a business facing corporates and anybody involved in infrastructure is really going to do, do well. And all of that applies to Nigeria and it applies generally across, across the continent. If you look at the bank now, the mix between retail and your corporate and investment banking, yeah. what, are, what are we looking at from a structure perspective? We've traditionally been a 50-50 bank between wholesale and retail. Um, and one of the consequences of that is that uh, we respond to business cycles different to our competitors. We've got a far larger corporate and investment banking business uh, relative to our competitors. Uh, and it shows up in a number of different ways in market shares, but also in the way our profit and loss account uh, behaves. When we talk about market share, it's a hotly contested area, this yeah. financial services arena in yeah. Africa. Is it difficult to stay ahead of the game? If the only measure is market share, it really is difficult. So here in South Africa, we are a large player. In retail, we are a leader in deposits. Uh, we're a leader in, um, um, in uh, home loans. But we're a laggard, if I could use that expression, in vehicle and asset finance. Um, in the wholesale part of the business, we are the leader by any measure you want to use in respect of global markets, so derivatives. We are also the leader in capital markets, mergers and acquisitions, and so forth. When you go north, we are large, we've got large market shares in small economies, 
and small market shares in large economies. And so the opportunity is to protect and preserve what we've got in South Africa, as well as in a number of the countries that neighbor South Africa. And then to be going for scale in places like Nigeria, where we are number 11, uh, if, whether you measure us by assets or by liabilities, and the same with Kenya. Earlier you mentioned commodities. I, I think it's uh, fair that we need to touch on that in a little more depth, given your, your Africa exposure yeah. and what consequences could possibly be in the pipeline for lower commodity prices for longer for Standard Bank with that uh, rest of Africa exposure? So the first observation I would make and I would argue to you is, uh, is that we drive our strategy off what we believe our purpose is and our purpose as Standard Bank is Africa is our home, we drive her growth. And so we would argue to the investment community as much as we would to our clients that we take a long-term view. So we look through... And this is cyclical. It's, yeah, and we look right through the crisis and right through the challenges that, uh, uh, that we face. So if you take our business in Nigeria, it's a, a very good business in a number of segments and number of sectors. It's struggling as a consequence of the, uh, the, the economy in Nigeria. But we know that uh, the oil price is going to stabilize. It may stabilize at a much lower uh, price than, uh, than the peak, but the industry will restructure, and likewise the Nigerian economy. Um, if you turn to copper, uh, you're seeing similar effects in respect of a country like Zambia, which is hard hit as a consequence of, uh, of copper. However, you see other countries that actually have uh, benefited from some commodities. They've benefited if they are oil importers, and they've benefited from well, that, the cocoa the, price, the, the for example. That's the beauty of the geographic diversity. Which was the point I was making about uh, the lack of correlation between a lot of the countries. ICBC has 20% of you. Quite right. But there hasn't been much talk about what has developed as a result of that relationship. Yep. And I think over the years, I was expecting to see a bigger Chinese influence within the Standard Bank Group. Is it just because I'm an outsider and you don't talk widely about it? Um, let's look at some of the facts. Um, ICBC acquired 20% of Standard Bank. They provided us with capital at a really interesting time um, in, in banking in the world. They've provided us with liquidity. They've participated uh, in syndicates, in club loans, and so forth. Um, and so that's at, uh, at, at, at the one level. At the other level, we have been privileged to participate in a whole slew of transactions that we couldn't have dreamt of, but for the fact that we're associated with the largest financial institution in, in the world. Um, and so we've had access to their client base. We've had access to Sino-Africa trade and we've had access to Sino-Africa investment. We've been able to service clients coming into Africa, ICBC's clients, and we've also been able to s service clients going from Africa to, uh, to, to, to China. Um, that couldn't have happened if this relationship did not exist. They have two board members. They're immensely constructive. Uh, they challenge, um, and they're a, a great board members. We have an arrangement, a formal arrangement, a cooperation arrangement, which was uh, consummated again um, when President uh, uh, Chairman Zhang was out here a couple of weeks ago. Um, he was with a group uh, called Yaboli, uh, a group of Chinese entrepreneurs, and they were here to look for opportunities. That wouldn't have happened if we didn't have a relationship with ICBC. So there's been huge value from the relationship. Immense, and it's long term. And so, and I say this, uh, with all honesty, our partners think in the long term. You and I were talking about that. We've been around for 150 years. Ben and I hope that we'll make a contribution to a company that will be around for another 150 years. Our Chinese partners think like that too. They think in centuries. have uh, uh, hot debates on the news desk around the state of the consumer in South Africa. Yeah. Given the indebtedness uh, of the average man in the street, and secondly, now that we're starting to see this rising interest rate cycle, what is your feeling? Because you've obviously got a much better gauge yeah. as to what is happening with the consumer in South Africa. 
Bronwyn, it, so one of my biggest worries is the health of the consumer, given the headwinds that, uh, that are coming our way. Um, and so you've hit the nail on the head. Uh, rising interest rates are going to put a large number of our clients under strain. Uh, job losses, particularly in the mining industry and other industries that uh, are being spoken about, will obviously put our, our business under, under strain. We are very, very worried. Consumer confidence is low, and so is business confidence. So you think we're in for tough times? We're in for, for very tough times, for another... Tougher times than we've seen some? Um, I don't want to get too negative because I am, I, I tend to be more on the negative side of, of this discussion. So I'm a glass half full person to the extent that you're a glass half, half empty, empty person. Um, so I see headwinds, I see um, rising interest rates, a slowdown in the economy, tough scenario in the jobs environment. But then I also see immense potential, a country with fantastic infrastructure, uh, the electricity issues that we've got being ultimately addressed. There is a generation plan, there is a distribution plan, the management is being sorted out at ESCOM. In the fullness of time, the cap on South Africa's growth rises as a, as a consequence of proper execution of ESCOM's projects. The likewise uh, with Transnet, the uh, logistics issues in the country get addressed. I can see a scenario where all of that happens. Is it uh, going to happen quickly enough, given that unemployment is at 25 percent? I wish I were a soothsayer, but I know, though, that we are. I'm so, I certainly am part of a of, of South African society that makes the case and argues for more coherence in policy. We celebrate it when it happens. We speak truth to power when it's when when it's necessary to do so. I'm saying uh, we all know what needs to be done. Our leaders also know, and sometimes they. They, they, they act and they, uh, they implement uh, what is necessary. I think it is possible for us to grow at above 5%, and we all know what, what needs to be done is, is, is the point I'm making. Earlier we touched on the 2008 financial crisis and the implication or the impact it had on the banking environment. One of the consequences of the crisis has been increased regulation for mm -hmm. financial institutions. Is it difficult to maneuver now, given the regulatory pressures that banks are facing? Um, again, let me frame my answer by saying I'm, I'm of the view that because of the role financial institutions play in an economy, it is necessary for us to be regulated. I'm also of the view that South Africa's regulations are amongst the best in the world. South Africa led, uh, has been one of the leaders in the implementation of Basel III. Uh, a number of the countries outside South Africa um, have got high capital adequacy ratio, uh, ratios, they've got tight liquidity requirements, uh, and supervision is intrusive and is great and is tight. Um, it sounds like you're so celebrating the regulation. I'm, f I'm framing my answer before. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying I accept the, the, the importance and the validity of that. And in fact, in the case of South Africa, we are in the top 10 safest and soundest uh, 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 institutions the from the World Economic North. Forum perspective. And that is because of the regulation and because of the great risk management in the country. However, too much of a good thing can be bad. And I would offer to you that uh, the capital requirements um, and the liquidity requirements, particularly the net stable funding ratio requirements, technical term, we have to have deposits that uh, are of a similar length to our lending, yeah, essentially will make it very, very difficult for many financial institutions to meet their clients' requirements for long-term funding. What are the consequences then? The consequences of that is slower lending, less lending, and the consequences of that Businesses are slower will suffer, Businesses entrepreneurs will suffer. Will suffer. And, and, yeah. and so I would argue that in that instance, that kind of regulatory uh, and legislation, which goes beyond what is required, and in fact in the case of uh, South Africa is imposing medicine for a malady that South Africans don't suffer from um, is, is tough. But we are in debates. We are you going to have to live with it? Or do you think that those debates may hold some weight and you could change the road, the path on the regulation front? It is in the lap of the gods. We've said what needs to be said. Uh, we've made our submissions where appropriate. And when asked the question, we give the answer that I've just given you. Let's talk about transformation in South Africa and bring it right to your home base here within the Standard Bank fold. Yeah. Do you think transformation is happening quickly enough? 
Uh, no, I don't think it's happening quickly enough. But one has to also say that transformation is not happening in a vacuum. It's happening in a historical context. Um, there are huge efforts being made by many men and women in different institutions, whether in the public sector or in the private sector. In our case at Standard Bank, we believe that it is necessary to increase diversity um, because it makes absolute business sense for us. Uh, and we will continue to drive hard in achieving those, those noble objectives. The fact of the matter is that we have done an enormous amount. Just if I could just give you a couple of examples. One, the banking industry in South Africa has lent se over 70 billion rand uh, in uh, uh, low-income housing, uh, over 16 billion rand for uh, uh, BE financing. Um, we have just matured our BE transaction at Standard Bank. The value created is 10.7 billion rand. Uh, 6,000 of our staff benefited from that, about 260 SMEs have benefited and so have the partners of Standard Bank in that transaction. So you are truly driving a broad based? We are pushing hard that this has to be systematic, it has to be broad and it has to be long term. It has to be profound, it has to be pervasive and we have to make sure that it's permanent. No shortcuts is, is my point. And uh, the point you make is also that it is a journey. It's yeah. a long-term journey. It's not going to happen overnight. I'd be remiss if I didn't come back to China because yes. my thoughts have just come back to the fact that we're seeing a pressure on the Chinese market. And uh, mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of debate as to whether we're going to see the bottom falling out of, mm -hmm. of China. Does that have implications for you given ICBC? I don't think it's got direct and immediate uh, implications, but I think it's got long-term implications. If uh, the Chinese economy slows, and it slows dramatically, Sino-Africa trade will slow, and so will Sino-Africa investment. So that is a concern. But right now, you are, there's a clear horizon. It's not as though this is something that you're debating at the boardroom table on a daily basis. No, uh, but we reflect on it when we think about the forces, the global forces that will impact our competitive position. And we reflect on the various scenarios and we think, we think them through. I have to make reference to your age, Sim, because... You're very nasty to me today. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's astounding that... Uh, and I know last year you were 47, so I'm assuming that somewhere along the way you are turning 48 this year or have turned 48. In December this year. Right. So mm -hmm. that must make you among the youngest CEOs uh, of the top 40 on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. It's phenomenal that you are in this position at such a young age. Do people make reference to it or am I just uh, doing something odd? Or do people talk about your age? Um, they do, um, but I have to point out that um, uh, there are a number of other uh, young CEOs. Mike Brown is only a year or so older than I am. Um, but yeah, it, they're, youth, they're not that many. Yeah. I mean, this is, you've, you've done incredibly well um, very quickly. Thank you. I've been at the right place at the right time. And I suppose given the fact that Africa is pushing to have the youngest population in the world, that it's appropriate that you are in this position because perhaps that's something that, that the youth mm -hmm. can aspire to in terms of achieving, uh, climbing through the corporate ladder mm. in, the, in the pace that you've done that at? I am part of a generation, though, that is starting to occupy leadership positions, uh, people in their late 40s uh, and early 50s. Um, but yeah, it is a privilege. Globally, and I can't your argue peer with group, you. do you also see that the leadership is, uh, is transferring to uh, younger and younger people? There are a number of young people in leadership positions, but at forums that I attend, uh, I'm usually one of the younger people. So. Your statement is correct. I mean, I can't argue against, uh, against the fact. Sim, your legacy. Yeah. What do you want it to be? Um, maybe let's use this analogy. When, when, if my wife decides that there's going to be a, um, uh, a tombstone, I hope it will say something like, uh, here lies a man and a banker who did his best. That's a little somber. Let's not talk about your, your tombstone. I'm sure your wife's going to put a tombstone. Something like that. I'm try uh, the legacy I would love to leave is um, a happy family uh, which makes a contribution 
um, and a business that I've worked for, whether it be Standard Bank or anything else that I'll work for uh, in future, where we've made a difference to, to society. One more thing, the proverbial, mm. what keeps you up at night? Yeah. So we touched upon it a little earlier. So it's the South African economy, and in fact, the African economy is a consequence of a global, a global pressures. That's one. The second one, um, I worry about um, the the future as uh, digitization and machines increasingly have an impact on on life, and whether or not all of us will be. Uh, in a position to respond appropriately. And thirdly, I worry about the levels of crime generally. On the, the crime note, what can we do about it? Whether it's media, whether it's big business, if it's not in government's hands, is there something that we can do to curtail crime? Because that's what keeps me awake at night. I think it's different, different things. So somebody like me can make a contribution by making the case for and acting upon the reduction of unemployment, the reduction of poverty, and the reduction of inequality. Uh, in my case, also by driving that the institution that I work for actually does what a great bank does uh, in society. Um, and then by being vigilant, by, um, by, uh, by being an active citizen, making a contribution. Um, and as far as cybercrime goes, by doing your best to, to stay abreast with uh, the latest developments and acting uh, on the facts that, uh, that present themselves. Sim, appreciate your insights as always. I've been chatting to Sim Shablala, the CEO of Standard Bank. You're watching Captains here on CNBC Africa.